Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I must say thank you to all our trainees from Northwest School of Radiology who have agreed to have their session being live streamed for the benefit of others. So I'm just waiting for a couple of them. Can I request? Uh, Hello, good afternoon. Uh, so I must say thank you to all our trainees from Northwest School of Radiology who have agreed to have their session being live streamed. No problem. So right now, I would like to request uh, whoever is going on hot seat from the Northwest training scheme. So shall I call out the names? That might be better. Yep, yeah, sure. Yeah. Samyukta, do you want to go first? <laughs> you got yeah. Volunteered into that one, didn't I? <laughs> Right. No pressure for ignore about everyone else in the room. Okay, so just uh, this is just practice viva. So go for it. So I'm just going to sc share screen. So let me know if you're able to see my screen. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do set one. And how do I stop notification? Let me do that. Uh, there's lots of people joining and it keeps beeping. <laughs> okay, let's let's crack on. So this is your first case. Patient presented with uh, shortness of breath. Okay, um, this is a uh, frontal chest uh, radiograph of a skeletally mature patient. There is a homogeneous increased uh, opacification of the left uh, hemithorax. Uh, with increased density in the left hilar region, um, as well as volume loss with elevation of the left hemidiaphragm mm -hmm. and um, shifting of the hilum. Mm -hmm. There's also um, an elucent uh, crescentric focus adjacent to the aortic knuckle in keeping with the lift sickle sign. And all of these point towards um, left, uh, lower, left upper lobe collapse, sorry. Um, so in an adult patient, I would correlate with a smoking history, but the most important etiology that needs to be ruled out is an underlying endobronchial tumor. And the increased density in the hilar region suggests some lymphadenopathy or an endobronchial mass. So they need um, urgent um, referral uh, to respiratory team. If they're coming from the GP, they need to arrange an urgent CT, um, thorax and abdomen for staging. I'm also looking at this study to see if there is any bony erosion. There are no pleural effusions because that would indicate the staging from the plain radiograph itself, but they do need to be worked up and discussed in MDT and um, probably bronchoscopy for tissue diagnosis. Brilliant, okay. So what I'll do is I'll go through around, um, for 15 minutes, I'll do the viva as you would have in the exam, okay? So I will ask relevant questions where necessary. And uh, I'm not going to trick you anywhere. So this is going to be straightforward viva in the exams and uh, go through with uh, observation, interpretation, principal diagnosis, differential diagnosis and management step by step. And then after 15 minutes, I'll go through the case review of all the cases I've shown you. Okay. Okay. Going to the next case. <clears throat> this patient presented to a &E following a fall on outstretched hand. Okay, this is... Um, uh, if you want to take control, just request remote control. Okay. I'm not sure how to do it on Zoom. <laughs> okay, so, okay, I will give it to you. No oh, problem. sorry, yeah, yeah. Fine. Yeah, approve, yeah, okay. 
Um, so I'm just going to zoom in um, to just examine the bony cortices uh, for a fracture with the history of trauma. I note that this is a skeletally mature patient. Mm -hmm. And we have two views. Um, this region catches my eye at the base of the fourth uh, metacarpal. There is some irregularity there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking at the hamate and the fifth as well, because they're common areas that tend to be injured. The scaphoid is fine. The distal radius is fine. I'm just correlating that region specifically on the other view. Um, and there's some irregularity of the hamate as well. So I think um, there's a fracture of the base of the fourth metacarpal and uh, the hamate. Um, I'm just looking at the rest of the bones for satisfaction of search and there's no obvious other injury. So I think this is an acute traumatic uh, fracture um, at the um, um, metacarpal carpal joint um, at the base of the fourth metacarpal and hamate specifically. The patient will need orthopedic um, team input um, and uh, I would immediately red dot it and inform the um, a &E team. Very good. So you mentioned about fracture hamate and fracture at the base of the fourth. Uh, is the articulation okay? Like I'm just going to reset it. Is the alignment okay here? No, there is actually dislocation at the base of the fifth um, metacarpal um, at the metacarpal um, hamate yeah. uh, joint. Good. Okay, so this patient is a young, uh, so you can uh, scroll through if, if you have a mouse or you can click this one and drag the slider. It's a HRCT chest in a young patient who presents with shortness of breath. Uh, this is a young patient and there's multiple cysts um, bilaterally uh, diffusely distributed throughout both lungs. Uh -huh. um, they're of different sizes, um, but they're quite well defined and it's a female. And I note that there's a, uh, a pleural effusion in the base of the left, um, left lung. Um, there aren't any nodules that I could see. Um, and uh, they're not sparing the CP angles um, and they're involving the APCs as well. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, cystic lung disease in a female with the um, effusion, I think I would look at it more in soft tissue windows, but I think this is most in keeping with lymphangioleomyomatosis. Mm -hmm. um, I would look at the base of the scan in soft tissue windows to look at the kidneys if they are included um, for something like uh, tuberous sclerosis, yep. where they get angiomyolipomas, <clears throat> and I'll correlate with the history and any brain imaging um, that's on the system. Uh, they'll need respiratory team input and discussion in MDT, and they could consider tapping this effusion for some chylus fluid um, and uh, correlate clinically um, in that sense. Um, so that's what I would do with this patient. Okay, anything else in terms of patient has got siblings? So uh, if it is syndromic, then it's autosomal dominant. So they'll need to be referred for genetic counseling and uh, testing because it's autosomal Excellent. dominant inheritance. Excellent. Good. Next case. Just give me one second. Okay, this patient presented with uh, history of uh, headache. Okay, it's just a non contrast CT brain. Okay. Feel free to scroll. Yeah. So I have axial um, unenhanced slices of uh, CT brain, a relatively young patient uh, because the sulcal spaces are. Um, 
not abnormally widened. There is this region of hyperdensity that catches my eye in the um, inferior sagittal sinus uh, region. Um, and I'm suspicious for um, uh, venous sinus thrombosis. Um, I'm just having a closer look for any complications such as venous hemorrhage or infarcts and uh, there aren't any. Um, in my normal practice, I would reformat it for any subtle um, abnormalities. I would also think about the underlying cause. So I would look, um, I'm just glancing at the sinuses, the paranasal sinuses and the mastoid air cells and they're aerated. So it's not an infection that's coming from there. Um, so I would think about working the patient up for an underlying hypercoagulable state, a uh, hematological disorder, for example, and this needs to be immediately alerted to the clinical team. Um, I think that the diagnosis is convincing here, but the CT venogram would be the gold standard. Uh, okay, so I'll give you the CT venogram. So that's just a three-dimensional images, but then if you scroll through, you will see the actual data set. <clears throat> If you need to change the windows, it's on the top of the screen. So contrast enhanced uh, venographic phase CT. Um, so this confirms my finding because there is a filling defect in the inferior sagittal sinus. I was just looking at the other sinuses, uh, the other um, kind of the transverse sinus and superior sagittal sinus and there aren't further clots, um, but uh, this uh, is pretty convincing. The patient will need um, urgent neurological um, kind of stroke team input and a referral for um, neuro, neuro center or IV thrombolysis if there aren't any complications. Um, so this is an emergency as it's a reversible cause and I'll inform the clinical team immediately. Okay. <laughs> So next case is a um, patient who presented with, uh, again, shortness of breath. I'm oh, sorry, I was just trying to zoom in. Uh, yeah. Is the image quality optimal? Is it looking okay? Um, I think so. Yeah, I think it looks all right. Good. Um, so this is a um, plain uh, radiograph of um, a skeletal mature patient. Um, and I can see that she has a porter cath um, in situ with the tip at the junction of the SVC and the right atrium. So it's appropriately um, sighted. Um, is it definitely sighted? Sorry? Is it definitely right sighted? Uh, no, it's left-sided. So the patient has uh, dextrocardia. Yes, um, that's um, that's how it was presented to me when I was uh, reporting this from the film. The radiographer thought it looked a bit weird, so they flipped the image on Pax and saved it like that. Oh, okay. The actual image, okay? Yeah, yeah. So the patient has dextrocardia because the left-sided, um, the, the heart is reversed, the heart side of the heart. And I think the gastric bubble is also um, reversed. So it's a situs inversus. And um, there's increased reticulation in both lower zones of the lungs. Um, and I think it's tubular branching. So um, I'm suspicious that this patient has underlying bronchiectasis, which would be in keeping with something like cartagenous syndrome. Um, and uh, as well as the um, long-term antibiotics that would probably be delivered through the um, porticath. So it would correlate with the clinical history. There's no obvious uh, a past, uh, consolidation or collapse on this uh, radiograph. So I would compare with the previous and um, it shows pretty stable chronic appearances. Excellent. So this patient, uh, <clears throat> presented with abdominal pain. So this is just a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis performed in portal venous phase. So feel free to scroll through the data set and give me the reasons why this patient is having abdominal pain. And uh, the a &E is also a bit worried about, uh, you know, like uh, patients a bit hypotensive. Okay. Thank you. 
there was an abnormality in the um, kidney region. So I'm just going to go back and focus on that. Um, oh, sorry, it's jumping. Um, so there's a large um, exophytic mass arising from the uh, left uh, kidney, yep. um, which is enhancing um, heterogeneously. Sorry, did you say? Sorry, what was the history again? <laughs> Patient presenting with abdominal pain and also getting a bit of a low, a low pulse rate, high pulse rate on uh, examination. Okay. Um, there's also um, bulky... so tell me about the kidney first. So let's do one at a time. Yeah. So what do you um, think of the renal mass? So initially I was thinking, is it something like um, an angiomyolipoma because there's um, low density foci within it, especially the central region. Okay, if you stop scrolling, yeah. that central region, does it look like fat, which is um, over here? No, it doesn't. It looks like it soft does. tissue density. Correct. And uh, could that be something? Uh, and what's the pattern here? Like, is does it look like uh, something? Um, so it, it has like a, like a spoke wheel kind of center. Um, something that looks like that is an oncocytoma with a central scar. Um, so I was thinking a solid mass in an adult, you have to think about renal cell carcinoma, but this scar is typical of an oncocytoma, which is a mimic of renal cell so carcinoma. If this was RCT, what are the other things you would be worried about? And um, how do you confirm that this is just benign and not malignant? So I would look for associated lymphadenopathy, any invasion into the uh, left renal vein or IVC. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, they, they would most likely biopsy it to exclude underlying malignancy, um, actually, I think. Do they biopsy RCC? Sorry? Do they biopsy RCC? Um, I think so, yeah. No, they wouldn't. <laughs> I will come back to that. Okay, so that's well done. So why is this patient having abdominal pain? Again, you, you can scroll through if you want to. Is there any other reason why the patient is dropping her blood pressure and having abdominal pain? Um... So the adrenal gland looks bulky. I would look on lung windows for... Um, so when I, whenever I say uh, hypotension in CT abdomen, what should trigger in your brain? Like uh, what all conditions you should be looking for? Um, so a bleeding point, um, any hemoperitoneum. Um, or? Or... Uh, Abdominal aorta leaking, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, um, uh, or... Um, so it's mainly related to bleeding, isn't it? So yeah. any aortic pathology. Did you see anything? Did anything catch your eyes while you were scrolling? Um, so the patient has atherosclerotic disease and uh, there is intramural thrombus. Okay, um, stop scrolling. <laughs> So just come to the left common iliac. What's happening here? Sorry, yeah. Um, just, so yeah. there's disruption of the calcification in the wall. Um, and it's... Um, it, it, the clot is um, hyperdense. So um, I'd be worried about sort of impending rupture and disruption of the clot. Okay, so is there, a, is there a name, particular name for this appearance where you can see contrast within the clot? Um, dissection with, I would have a flat, flat there, so. Um, okay, I think you've done very well. Uh, that's time up for your uh, Bible <laughs> session. I think uh, you did extremely well. So I'll go over this case. And that was very good presentation. You were very confident. 
and your approach is uh, really good. So in the exam, I wouldn't change anything in terms of your technique. Okay, so keep up the same technique. So talk through the right observation. Talk about important negatives. That is also important in the exams. And then come to a reasonable set of uh, differential diagnosis and tell what you think is the actual diagnosis. And then talk about further management. So don't stop before you talk through the case until the point of further management, which I was very, really impressed with your viva. In this particular case, yes, uh, it's a, a, a left-sided uh, oncocytoma. So that was correctly picturized. So whenever you have a renal mass, uh, you have to think like a clinician. So can, does this mass needs to come out or does, is it going to stay with the patient? Okay, that's the first question you want to answer. For that, uh, basically, you are asking yourself, is it RCC or something else? So if it's RCC with that size, you will be looking for any regional lymphadenopathy or breach in the capsule, renal capsule, or uh, looking for thrombosis in the renal vein or extension into the IVC or any evidence of metastatic disease. In any cancer, you start from the disease where it starts and then look for local invasion, nodal invasion, metastatic disease. It can be any cancer. It can be breast, renal, thyroid, hepatic, bones, wherever it is in the exam they would expect you to describe starting from the local disease and then going through local invasion, and then nodal disease as the cancer would behave in the actual terms. Okay, and then look for metas. You do that process and then you say that this is looking very benign. I wouldn't touch this lesion. I would always compare it with the previous film to see if it has changed in size or any characteristics and then move on to the next finding. So in this patient, there are a couple of things which can give rise to pain abdomen. So basically you got uh, uh, an uncomplicated gallstones, but again, there is no cholelithiasis. So there's a very bright gallstone there. And then the, if you look at the aorta, it's heavily atheromatous. There is good amount of contrast in it. And as we come towards the common eye vessel, you can see that the contrast extends into the thrombus. So if I magnify, you can see it's like a pre-dissection. So you can see a flap there. So this is a penetrating ulcer. Okay. Okay. So that is uh, something to look for in the exam. Uh, but apart from this, I would still score you on a 7 out of 8 for this particular case. And the rest of the case, you were 7, 7.5. So I just go back to the uh, previous case. One, This is a Cartagena syndrome. This was, a, again... Uh, Whenever you have Portacat in the exam, your approach was brilliant. You said it's in the, the tip is in the SVC right atrium junction. So that was pretty good. You identified what type of catheter it is. So this is Portacat. So you can get Portacat when you have conditions which require long-term treatment. It can be cancer, in, in which case it will be chemotherapy, or it can be long-term antibiotics in patients like uh, cartagenous or cystic fibrosis. So this just looks pretty much normal. Uh, I need to get rid of this uh, annotation. So, yeah. So in this, uh, it's a situs inversus rightly picked up and uh, correct. Uh, whenever you get genetic conditions in the uh, final uh, sentence, please ensure you mention about uh, uh, genetic counseling and uh, tracing and things like that. Uh, zero four was uh, venous sinus thrombosis. Again, very well done. And you picked up the cord sign uh, and then you looked for venous hemorrhage. So in the exam, you can say that I would normally look for venous hemorrhage in parasagittal, uh, par uh, along the superior sagittal sinus. It will be in this mid band where you actually get the hemorrhage and rest of the scan looked absolutely normal. In the exam, again, you touched upon management, which I was very impressed. Like you talked about thrombolysis, both intravenous and direct thrombolysis can be performed if there is a heavy clot burden and uh, direct thrombolysis is performed in the neurocenter. But uh, if it's just IV thrombolysis, it can be in consultation with the neuro team. And then uh, what was the other thing I wanted to? So know your anatomy of venous sinus thrombus. So in the exam, they can ask questions of, where is the transverse sinus? Where is the sagittal sinus? Show me the internal cerebral vein and things like that. So just the major vessels and just brush through the anatomy as well. Mm -hmm. uh, case number three was uh, again, uh, 
spot on. These are classic cases that you will get in the exam. So, uh, in the exam, your approach should be uh, you won't see weird and wonderful things for sure. Okay. Uh, if there are 100 cases, out of which 80% will be classic cases. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, there are three types of cases that you can get in the exam. One is a classic antony like this one, like where you have got uh, the cyst like appearance scattered, very thin wall lamb, and then uh, you approach it in a very nice way. So, the best thing about lamb or LCH is that there is no loss of lung volume. So, that is one sentence I would add in your phrase when you're describing this, whether mm -hmm. it's a chest x ray or CT, when you're talking about interstitial lung disease. If there is no lung volume, it can be only three things. No loss of lung volume. One is LAM, another is LCH. And what's the other one? Um, COPD. <laughs> oh, yeah, hyperinflation, yeah. So whenever you see holes in the lungs without loss of volume, these are the three conditions that, that can affect. So that's important. And then you right picked up uh, chylothorax on the left side. Um, the second type of uh, cases you'll get in the exam is the one I showed you with uh, respect to the renal uh, mass and uh, like a more descriptive and engaging description between the examiner and the candidate. So it, you won't know a diagnosis, but you will go through certain findings and describe properly and uh, look at your approach. Like uh, uh, just imagine a surgeon coming for an opinion. So that will be that kind of a case. And the third type of cases will be, I have no clue about this case. Okay. And that will come around 20%, 10 to 20%. In that time, the examiner is only interested in knowing your approach. Some weird arthritis if you get up. So he just wants to see how you will deal with that uh, in a correct uh, chrono, in a correct order. Like, is it bilateral, symmetrical, it's affecting one joint, many joints? Is this rheumatoid versus osteoarthritis? Can this be inflammatory? Is this gout or something like that? So you just need to have an order in which you look at it. So I think okay. overall, uh, pretty impressive performance. So good luck. I'll probably catch you next time uh, for another Viva. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great feedback. Excellent. So who is going next? Uh, yeah, I can go. Hi, Abhi. Have you got a cam? No? Let me... No, <laughs> no problem. Okay. So let's go back. Is it, is it working now? I borrowed a camera from. Oh, perfect. It's always good to see people when you're teaching. <laughs> and then, uh, okay. So, connections. What will be the pattern of mass effect? So, usually you might. Depend on it's unlikely to get a sulfur sign, unlikely to get a sulfur sign herniation. You mm -hmm. might get a transtentorial herniation. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to look if there's any transtentorial herniation and also look at the foramen magnum, magnum if there's any, any herniation. There is a bit of pressure, local pressure within the frontal horn. So an element of hypoattenuation within the frontal, frontal horn. But usually I like to look at this in the uh, corona plane. That gives me a better idea of it. Okay, that's the coronal plane? Yeah. Yeah, that's like a rabbit ear, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. so there isn't any significant uh, trans, as in downward transtentorial herniation, but there is a pressure effect on the, front, uh, uh, the frontal lobes, especially adjacent to the valves, and then effacement of the lateral ventricles. So there is a local pressure. Some of this, I, I like the referring physician with a view of uh, uh, neurosurgery involvement, uh, depending on the center. Sometimes they, uh, they look at the, the they do intraperineal pressure. Uh, money. If it's high, they do kinectomy to relieve the pressure. Good. Very good. So let's go to the next case. So this patient uh, is the, just a cervical spine performed in ED. Okay, patient had a fall. So you can click on the relevant images to evaluate. And if you want to manipulate, these are the keys here. Is there a way to turn? 
rotate it yeah uh, let me do it for you so leave leave the mouse okay why don't i just uh, take remote control stop oh, sorry i think i missed it um, can you see the screen again yep yeah okay so let me do the movement okay that's your lateral projection okay so this is an uh, a lateral view of the cervical spine mm -hmm. uh, with areas of uh, the occiput and then the upper part of the thorax showing. Mm -hmm. uh, my normal part, I usually go through uh, the soft tissue, measure the size of the pre-vertebral soft tissue, go to the anterior vertebral line, the posterior vertebral line, mm -hmm. and just at the anterior vertebral line between C3 and C4. Okay, that's C2. C3 and C4. Yeah, I think it's a slight anterior listasis of C3 okay. yeah. over C4. Yeah, and what else is there? With a possible chip fracture, the inferior aspect yeah. of it. Uh, so what type of fracture is it called as? So it is... Uh, It's a clay chevalier fracture. No. No, clay chevalier fracture you tend to affect the posterior element. Uh, so you are crying now. So I'd say it's because there is a, uh, it's a step as I put listasis. I would like to properly assess the facet joints. Uh, Looking at it, it's slightly widening compared to the other. In my normal practices, uh, I will uh, possibly look at other views. Uh, is it okay if I, yeah. There isn't really much I can see on the AP view. And then, the, is there any on the, the other views? So, so the these are area. these are fine. In my normal practice, because I want to rule out an unstable fracture, because the face is joined this slightly, it might be, it looks like an unstable fracture, or I let the referring physician with a view of doing a CT scan and then uh, orthopedic or neurosurgery input advice. Okay. No problem. Okay. So let's look at this. This patient, uh, it's part of an infertility workup. Okay, this was an MR pelvis done in a young female who is uh, having uh, issues with uh, getting pregnant. Okay. So, this so is a. To take remote control. Okay. So, this is a T2 MRI of a pelvis. So, looking at the pelvic areas mm -hmm. uh, as a, a large, a big and large uterus with it looks like two centers with a spare, a fibrous spare mm -hmm. in between the uterus. It extends as far as to, it goes beyond the cervix. The cervix also has two spares. And looking at, it looks like the upper vagina also has to, and then it comes together. Uh, in my, the adnesis look, the right adnesis looks bubbly and uh, fine. So show uh, me where the adnex is, show me the ovaries. So this part of it. Really? So normally I cross check with the uh, uh, sagittal. Okay, I'll give you a sagittal. So let go of the mouse. Okay, here we go. So this is the first adnesa. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you mean ovary? Yes, the ovaries. Okay. So I got a high res ovary as well. So just give me one second. I'll give you a high res. Oh, actually, this is a um, normal thing. That's the high res one. Corona. So can you see the ovaries? Yeah. The so the, the, the left one is quite high. And then our... So what... Yeah. Is the ovary normal? Are you okay with it? It's the, the, the left ovary is quite high rising. And I, I want to look at the left, uh, examine the, the normal part. I like to look at the kidneys also, if the kidneys are a bit, a bit uh, present. I don't think but, they've scanned uh, the kidney. Okay. Uh, it's okay. So what are your thoughts right now? So having you made some key observations, so I'd yeah, so like to proceed. Uh, Biconvert uterus. It's one of my uh, dif uh, different. Uterus. Okay. Yeah. So and then, you said that uh, you have got a septum that extends all the way into the cervix and vagina. There are two yeah. vagina, two cervix. So is that a biconvert or something else? What is the name of that type of uh, uterine anomaly, where you have two uterine cavity? And two services to vagina. So it's a biconid bicolex. Okay. Anything else? What are the other uterine anomalies that you are aware of? So there's a septated uterus. Okay. Good. There's a biconid. There's a, a uniconid. Okay. A T shaped and aquate. And what's the other one? The uh, it's the um, die die die. The die die feels the die die feels. Yeah, yeah. Good. So of the all the types of anomalies, which one has got issues with infertility? So the septated has issues with infertility. So this person, this is just an incidental finding, and that's not the cause for infertility. So what's happening with the ovaries here? So it's it's a longitudinally oriented high riding. It's polycystic in nature on the right side. Mm -hmm. uh, the left side is also polycystic in nature. Uh, our, it looks like she is on the upper side of weight, looking at the soft tissue yeah. of, of it. So this can be uh, a polycystic uh, ovarian disease. Okay. Uh, I'll correlate with uh, the blood markers and then uh, look at the clinical history if there's any history of hirsutism okay. and uh, possibly refer to uh, Ghani MDT, Ghani doctor's MDT for discussion. Okay, good. So let's move on to the next case. Okay. So this will be probably your last one. So this patient presented with uh, painful knee, so four sequences here, standard T1, and then uh, three plane PDFS. And this. Okay, so uh, this is an MRI of a knee. Uh, so I go to the first one, I have a view about the, uh, using the T1, assess the bone. Uh, and the bone marrow, uh, no fracture, mm -hmm. uh, normal bone marrow sequence. Uh, looking at the PD. So I go to look at the uh, the anterior, look, look at the meniscus first. Mm -hmm. So look at the anterior aspect of the media meniscus. Go to, Then the posterior segment of it. It's just the. Okay, I think the menisci is okay. So just concentrate on extensor compartment. Yeah, I'm looking at the PCL. No, extensor compartment. Ah, okay. Forget about menisci. In, inside is fine. Okay. okay. So talk me through the extensor compartment. So looking at the extensor compartment.
So look at the, if you're started yes. with Sashal, make sure that you see from side to side all the images. Okay. Yeah. Before okay. you move to the next series. Okay. So looking at the extensor compartment. A diffuse lobulated collection. Mm -hmm. It tracks all the way in between the uh, the patella. Okay. It's set septated high signal. Okay. So show me on such tone. Good. Yeah. And on coronal as well. So always examine in all three planes. Yeah, on the corona. And that is looks like a soft tissue masses within. That's probably fat, isn't it? So yeah. if you look at D1. Just normal fat that's suppressed. Yeah. So yes, you can see a lobulated soft tissue mass adjacent to the superior aspect of the left knee joint, uh, extending into the extensor compartment. So what are your thoughts? What are the differential diagnoses here? So it's it's dark on on T one. So it's unlikely to be lipo uh, lipoma laborians. Uh, it's also bright on T two. So is unlikely to be PVNS. Why? PVNS can be bright on T2, isn't it? Okay, then I go for PVNS. But it's not PVNS. <laughs> okay. So what else can it be? So I need to see, this is exactly what I was uh, telling Samyukta previously. Like you have, you do get cases where it's uh, like, uh, have no clue cases, right? So then I am interested in how you approach this case. How do you come to a diagnosis? All right. So it's located in the posterior. So it's located in the posterior segment of the, uh, the, the knee. It is oh. T2. Why is it posterior? No, the posterior compartment. So posterior is behind, isn't it? So this is anterior, extensor compartment. Sorry, the extensor rather compartment. Sorry, the extensor compartment of the knee. Yeah. Uh, it, has, it tracks down to uh, in between the femur and the patella. It mm -hmm. is lobulated T2 high and septated. Mm -hmm. Very good. So when I scroll through this data set here, does it extend into the joint? Can you see that going into the joint? Yeah, it extends in, into the patellofemora. Yeah, but... yeah. So basically what I'm trying to ask you is, is this tumor or lesion linked to a, some part of the joint? Which part of the joint? Like uh, or which tissue of the joint? So it can be from... The, like the synovia. Yeah, it can be from synovia. Yes, yeah. because it's so bright. It looks like a fluid, isn't it? Yeah. So PVNS is one of the differential diagnoses. What are the other differential diagnoses for a synovial lesion? So synovia condomatosis. Good. But they are usually classified. They tend to be more classified. Yeah, but calcium is very hard to appreciate on MR, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So you can see there are a few areas of low signal intensity within the lesion on sagittal sequence here. So those are the areas of calcium. So this is synovial osteochondromatosis. Okay. Typically involves the uh, supralateral aspect of okay. the knee joint. Okay, so I'll just go over the cases. I think you're doing well. You still need to practice a bit. You've got time on your side. So you've got another six weeks before the exams, probably. So plenty of time. I'm sure you'll, you are on the right track. So don't worry. You, are, you, are, you have a good approach to spotting the abnormality. You are struggling a little bit in terms of putting things together and coming to, you know, like being very swift to moving into the next segment. So just 
keep in your mind that in the viva you just have to move from observation to interpretation to principal diagnosis to differential diagnosis and further management even before the examiner asks so in this case i would have approached like um, i would say this is mri knee the quickly go through and always like uh, when when you get mr of the knee don't uh, don't get uh, you know scared of if you get something that you don't know so you just make sure that you see from all the way from side to side the pathology will become obvious because when you get weird cases the pathology will be present uh, on the scan so here you have lobulated well defined soft tissue mass which has got a uh, low signal on t1 high signal on t2 it has as bright as joint fluid and it's extending into the joint so more likely this is a joint related uh, pathology therefore it is synovial tumor it can be a synovial osteochondromatosis pvns or even a synovial sarcoma you don't know what it is so that's your interpretation and differential diagnosis so going to the further management bit you can say that in my normal practice we don't encounter such exams if we get any soft tissue sarcoma we shall refer these to the regional soft tissue sarcoma services for further management okay, okay? so yeah. there the case can be discussed and they can do a biopsy and then decide about what to do next so that's how you would manage this case are you have still scored a 6 on this so don't beat yourself so you're doing quite well so previous case uh, uh, again there was this was something it, it was tricky Uh, because you probably wouldn't have seen many gyne mr but you were right in uh, going through saying that there are two endometrial cavities which extends all the way to the cervix and also the vagina so you got two everywhere so when you have two everywhere it's tied elfes okay yeah and then uh, you got confused with this uh, it is quite normal to get confused ovaries with something else because it's just a non fat suppressed t2 sequence so this is the ovary you can see multiple follicles in both ovaries which are less than 1 cm or 10 mm in size and arranged in necklace ring pattern so this is likely to be polycystic ovarian disease so you need to correlate with uh, endocrine assessment and gynecology review so that was one that i would still give you a 6 on that one out of 8 and then the previous cervical spine i i was hoping that you would nail this one you did get to the bottom of it but you struggled a bit in going through this case so you can see in your normal practice you said you would do anterior spinal line posterior spinal line and spinal lamellar line uh, here can you see this uh, bone fragment yeah yeah so that bone fragment is a uh, a uh, classical teardrop sign or flexion teardrop fracture okay so this is a very important significant injury because whenever you have flexion teardrop uh, fractures you get invariably facet joint dislocation so you need to look for perched facet so i'm just going to show you a very important sign so if you draw a line along the margins of the facet joint they should look like a rail track okay and then if you draw at one above you can see that the parallel line is disrupted so keep drawing a mental line along the margins of the facets can you appreciate the rail track sign or parallel line sign whereas mm -hmm. when you have a fracture here you should look for a facet joint above is this unilateral or bilateral facet joint fracture i mean unilateral or bilateral dislocation i think it's unilateral unilateral good because the degree of step is very minimal so if i uh, draw a line here and a line here you can see the gap is very very minimal right if this was a bilateral facet joint dislocation this would have been here so the gap would have been more than 50% of 
anteroposterior dimension of the vertebral body. So that's when you call it as bilateral. Bilateral is very easy to pick up and most people will see that one. So this is a unilateral facet joint dislocation related to flexion teardrop fracture. So what someone has asked me a question saying how to differentiate flexion and extension teardrop fracture. So it's based on the, why do you get teardrop fracture? Flexion teardrop fracture always happen anteriorly because you do like this and uh, the ligaments stretch and uh, it disrupts. I'm not sure I know the exact answer for that. Like uh, why do you get extension teardrop fracture? Basically, even in the exam, if you say this is a teardrop fracture, that is more than sufficient. So the more, the key thing is when you get these little fractures, you should not ignore and say the cervical spine is safe to move on. So it would be more of uh, looking for uh, ligamentous disruption resulting in facet joint arthropathy. Okay, so moving on to the next previous case. What was the other case I showed you, Abhi? A Sufi. Sufi and a bilateral extradural, right? So bilateral extradural, it is important to recognize two things. One is uh, the direction of mass effect will be from both sides. So you don't get a midline shift but you will see effacement and splaying of the anterior horn of lateral ventricle. It looks like a rabbit ear. Okay. So, and that's one thing. And then look at the sulci. So there's hardly any sulci, which is appreciable in the frontal region. So that is sulcal effacement is very important. When you see that you need to tell the patient, uh, tell the clinicians to refer the patient for neuro referral. So that was good. You did really well on that one. And uh, Sufi, yes, you were uh, spot on. So you got it right. And also you went through the management. I would score you seven on this one. <coughs> because uh, you were very good in picking up on the AP projection itself, saying that there's a left-sided Sufi. One thing you need to remember is, uh, uh, let me show you the frog leg. So if you imagine uh, this to be an ice cream, right? And a cone. So let's put the cone in brown. So what flavor ice cream is this? <laughs> Abby? Uh... Strawberry. Vanilla. I think vanilla. <laughs> vanilla. <laughs> nice. So you can see that the ice cream is dripping from the cone, right? Yeah. So that is Sufi. So that is metaphyseal extrusion sign. So if you look at the ice cream, it should sit on the medial inside of the cone. It should not drip along the margin. So if I put back the AP projection, you will see that uh, here the ice cream is pretty much nicely sitting inside the cone. Whereas here, the ice cream is not sitting inside the cone. It's going outside the cone. So therefore this is Sufi. So look for height of the epiphysis, look for the slip and uh, the epiphysis should not overlap, should not cross the growth plate and overlap the metaphysis. So that was very well done. And in the exam, they can talk about management. So that's exactly I was coming to the uh, point where uh, I asked you, will they, how do they fix it? They fix it prophylactically in the same position. They may or may not fix prophylactically the other side, unless the patient is symptomatic. If the patient is asymptomatic, they probably will watch over the other side most of the time. And when the patient becomes symptomatic, they'll repeat an x-ray to look for a slip. If there is no slip, they can also do an MR to look for any evidence of edema around the growth plate to look for pre-slip. Happy? Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. No problem. So who else have we got today? I don't mind going. Aaron? Brilliant. Yeah. So where are you working, Adam, currently? I'm in Salford. Salford. Very good. 
So we'll move on to set number two. So we'll stop remote control, clear annotation. Just give me one second, Adam. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, before I start this set, there are a couple of questions from the previous set. Do you, should you mind if I answer yeah, them? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, ask me. Yeah? Okay. Sorry, I think I clicked stop share again. Okay, here we go. So there are a couple of uh, questions from the last two vivas. So why we don't do biopsy in RCC? Okay, RCC is very notorious for uh, seed tracking. So you never do a biopsy for suspected RCC. It's always go nephrectomy because the uh, disease can seed along the surgical biopsy track. So in the exam, please don't say that uh, you will do biopsy of RCC. And also the RCC is very high. It's a very vascular tumor. So patient can bleed a lot. So they, these are the two reasons why you don't do biopsy. Uh, next question how to differentiate fraction extension that we have done. Uh, could we please discuss the metacarpal base fracture once again? Okay, we can do that. So that was um, set one. Case number two, I think. Yeah. Okay, so this is a very important film, especially for the purpose of um, rapid reporting. So look at the joint space here at the MCP joint. I'm rubbish at drawing with the mouse, but I think I can make out. So this joint at the base of the fifth metacarpal should look exactly like that. Okay, you should have a very clear defined joint space. So probably if I showed you another hand radiograph, you will realize that when it, this becomes a bit mushed, like uh, you don't see any clear articular margins, then you should suspect fracture dislocation of the fifth metacarpal base. So let me see if I've got any uh, rapid reporting sets. Mm. And does that make sense now? So you can see there is a very nice joint space at the carpal metacarpal joint. Okay. So next case, metaphyseal blanch is also seen on left due to overlap of slip physis. So that's good. Okay. So next, uh, let's go to the to be why we're teaching set two. Here we go, Aaron. This is your first case. Thanks, Samir. Can I just ask the um, metaphyseal extrusion sign? That's the same as the blanch sign, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. And you, and you just check, and is it like overlapping of the physis within the metaphysis? Is that what you're looking for? Correct, absolutely. So that's exactly what I was trying to describe in terms of, uh, you know, like ice cream on a cone. So if, if you consider epiphysis as the ice cream part of it, and then you have a growth plate, and then you have a cone. <laughs> So the epiphysis should always sit on top of the growth plate and it should not fall. So when you have a slip, you will see the epiphysis going on the side of the growth plate and uh, blanching on the metaphysis. So when you see overlapping of epiphysis on top of metaphysis, you should suspect Sophie. Okay. okay. Uh, brilliant. Okay, so this is a patient uh, who presented with knee pain. Uh, are you okay to give me control? Yeah, sure. No problem. Control. Here you go. Okay, so this is a uh, AP radiograph of the left knee in a squeeze So click on the image to take control, I think. Yeah. Yeah, is that? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. So I have not aware of the patient's age yet and I'm not too sure if it's a male or a female. Um, most obvious abnormality that I can see is um, projected over the 
proximal tibial metaphysis is an area of ill-defined sclerosis um, centrally and more to the left and I think there's um, some uh, extension periosteally um, on that lateral cortex of the tibia. You can um, ignore that one, Aaron. Pardon? You can ignore that observation. Okay. So patient has got some kind of a locked knee sensation. Okay, so um, the other abnormality that I'm, uh, I can see is within the medial femoral condyle. There's an area of low um, uh, attenuation, not just over like there, uh, which is a, the usual um, place for osteochondral defects. Um, with a patient who's got locking sensation, I'd be worried that the um, osteochondral defect is dislodged somewhere within the knee joint. Uh, so in my normal practice, I would um, discuss this with the referrer and ask them to make it an orthopedic um, referral. They may, may want further imaging to ascertain where the actual bony fragment is because I can't see it on this radiograph. Um, and that might uh, change that. Is practice. there another view provided? There's not another view provide, provided, but we could uh, look at a, a lateral um, radiograph. Yeah, leave, leave the mouse for a second. So... Okay, so on the um, lateral radiograph, we can see uh, posteriorly, there's something that looks like a fabella here. Um, have, have I got control? Uh, yes, yeah. I, would, I would just say go on to the MR straight away. So click on the image and then you can work through it. Uh, but also on that lateral radiograph, I think there was, um, there was an intercortical, uh, an inter, um, uh, there was a, a bony lesion which was in the uh, joint surface, uh, in between the joint surface of the tibia and tibia. So I'm just going to scroll through now. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm so feel free having a bit of difficulty there. The, all the four series. So you can see, you can pick the series from the side, okay? So my um, thing is not scrolling too well. Have you this looks like a, a fluid sensitive um, sagittal fat sat sequence. Um, the, the abnormality on the radiograph we can see is a high um, high signal. Sorry, um, I'm just trying to, to scroll this. It's not working particularly well with my mouse. Okay. How, are you scrolling with the mouse or with the trackball? With, with my mouse. With your mouse. If you're struggling, you can click on the arrows here at the bottom to... Ah, on these here. Yeah, so that becomes easier. So the, um, the the defects that we saw on the um, AP radiograph is seen on this MR in the femoral condyle. Mm -hmm. uh, this is in keeping with an os osteochondral defect. Um, so I am your orthopedic surgeon and I would like to know whether the, the should I take the patient to theatre or not? Can I sit on this kid? Uh, so if the patient's got a locking sensation within within the uh, as a clinical symptom, I think that's highly suggestive that there is a, a loose fragment within the the knee joint. Um, so I'd, I'd say that this you you would likely need to do an arthroscopy to try and find this um, uh, this bony defect based on the symptomology alone. Um, there was a there is a I've just I skipped over it then, but I just thought that there was a um, a low signal area within the here this here which looks concerning for a bony fragment because it's quite similar signal to the cortex itself um, and it's not although it's quite related it looks quite uh, quite close to the anterior horn of the like of some of, yeah yeah very yeah. good very good excellent good so let's move on to the next case so let them leave the mouse for a second um, so I'm going to take you to case number 2004, chest x-ray. Just give me one second. Okay, so this patient presented with the vomiting 
So this is a PA, a PA erect chest X-ray of a skeletally mature female. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I'm going to look um, at the lung zones and uh, ensure there's no um, consolidation or no obvious uh, focal lesion or pneumothorax, which I, um, I can't see. And then I'm going to focus more on the mediastinal structures because the patients are presented with vomiting. <clears throat> if you want to window or do anything, these are the, you can use the toolbar. So when you get a history of vomiting, what things you would like to look for on a chest X-ray? The things that I'm looking for are um, pneumomediastinum, mm -hmm. uh, pneumopericardium, which I can't see. Um, the one thing I'd like to, I'm just honing in more is just to see if there's any um, obvious air within the superior mediastinum. Um, <clears throat> uh, and also to look for things like uh, hiatus hernias and stuff like that. Isn't it? Very good. Um, what else? I'll, uh, to look for um, surgical emphysema within the neck or like with air tracking up within the, the fascial planes of the neck as well, which I, I can't obviously see here. Um, Very good. And I think the, there are... Uh, sorry. Which is the best investigation uh, in terms of plane film for a bowel obstruction? For a, a bowel obstruction? Mm. Uh, for a, an abdominal bowel obstruction? Yeah, abdom like, bowel well, obstruction, stroke, perforation. The most important um, radiograph you could do would be an erect chest x-ray because that tells you more um, informa information. If the patient's clinical bowel obstruction, you want to, rule, you want to look for things like perforation, which you wouldn't get that information on a spine radiograph. Okay, so good. So I'll just give you another film. So just uh, give... Okay. So it's the same patient. Okay. Um, can I ask if this was a supine radiograph or a? Sorry? Was this a, a supine radiograph or a PA radiograph? Uh, like an erect radiograph? Erect radiograph. Erect. Okay, so this is an erect radiograph. Yeah. Patient's abdomen. There is a... Um, a tube here projected over the uh, left of uh, sorry left of quadrant, um, which is typical for a gastrostomy tube. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also clips within the right upper quadrant, um, which are seen within a cholecystectomy. Okay, so <clears throat> tell me a little bit more about that uh, bit of tubing that you are seeing. Yeah. What type of tubing is it? Where is it used? And uh, is it normal? Uh, so I, I, on first inspection, I thought this was a, like a, a gastrostomy tube or, or um, a peg tube. Mm -hmm. um, Is it a gastrostomy tube or something else? Have you seen this before? I've not, I've not seen this tube before. So if I said patient was very fat and she wanted uh, to lose weight and they did some surgery. So this here looks like a... Um, a gastric band mm -hmm. and um, this tube I'm not too sure about but yeah, the um, gastric band so they're trying to do a gastric band surgery and now the patient is presented with a lot of uh, vomiting so is this gastric band in situ or like it's is it in right position it's not it's not in the um, it's not in the right position it's not orientated in the right axis so it looks like this um, gastric tube has slipped Okay. At this um, gastric band has slipped. Okay, so we did a CT because the patient is not very, you know, like uh, deteriorating and having a lot of pain abdomen. So feel free to scroll through the data set and let me know what you think. Okay, so this is an axial CT with, coral, uh, with um, IV contrast. Mm -hmm. So don't worry about the chest, just uh, concentrate only on the bits that we discussed on abdominal x-ray. Okay, so the esophagus is fluid-filled and dilated. So I'm just uh, getting used to this control. It's, uh, it's, it's 
just disobeying me. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> The gastric band is um, seen in the left upper quadrant and the, uh, the stomach distal to the band is distended. Just want to have a look at the GOJ as well. So it looks like it's obstructed, isn't it? So yeah. what happens when there is a gastric band slippage? Like so, what type of obstruction does it result in? So it would, um, in terms of like a gastric outlet obstruction or like a closed loop obstruction or like a, um, yeah, closed loop with vascular compromise. So how do you say it's a closed loop obstruction on CT? Or what are the so, features of a closed loop obstruction? Uh, with the closed loop obstruction, we're um, concerned that there'd be vascular compromise. Okay. Um, so, so we need to we, I did look at the um, gastric wall itself to see whether it's enhancing uh, okay. appropriately so, with this so scroll down and show me at the side of the band what's happening uh, do you mind taking up uh, taking over the wheel I'm just struggling to um, no problem to, That's okay, it. control of the uh, the mouse okay so that's the side of the band mm -hmm. so normally you know, when you do the gastric banding so what, what do they do? They just put a band around the fundus, isn't it? So, so that they can reduce the size. So how many loops of Powell should go through the band? Ideally. I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. I mean, if you logically, if you think, if they put just to the fundus, it's like a balloon and you want to construct it, there should be only one loop that's coming out. Right? So if you imagine... Uh, this to be stomach, okay? And if you are trying to do a gastric band by putting a compression on the fundal part of it, there should ideally be only one loop that's going through the band, correct? Hello? So now here we can see there are two loops that is going through the band. Aaron, are you around? Sorry, my um, uh, network is out, and I didn't hear. Uh, I didn't hear any of that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So here you've got two loops of bubbles. So therefore, basically, it's slipped, and uh, you've got uh, two loops that's going through the defect. That's why it's a closed loop obstruction. Yeah, so it's so, using just one one loop goes through the band. Yeah, there should only be one loop that goes through the. Uh, through the band. So that's a slipped band. So excellent. Good. So let's move on to the next case. Uh, okay, this is another patient. I'm going on a GI theme here. So this patient presented with uh, abdominal pain and vomiting. So are you okay for to scroll or do you want me to scroll through? I'll, I'll try and see if I'll use the uh, book as a copy. So click on the image. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so um, I've got So this is a contact and um, mm -hmm. access to the screen. And scroll uh, all the way through first and then uh, focus on um, some areas that have to be used to the So um, there are a few abnormalities within this CT. Um, there's gross intraperitoneal free fluid, um, particularly around the liver and also within the, um, the pelvis. And there are multiple um, dilated groups of small bowel mm -hmm. in the pelvis. Um, whenever looking at small bowel dilatation, 
um, think that options and biosectors do this sort of treatment idea for that tends to um, happen in the immediately um, dilated pre synoptic segment of the the transition point. Very good. So, um, uh, I can see the swirling of the medium for here, and then um, there are there is a transition point here, and then there's another transition point here as well. So um, I would be concerned this is based on that, this is a closed loop option to give us a two valve um, two transition points. Okay. After that, I'd like to examine the um, the small bowel wall itself make sure it's a transition as well. Um, nematosis uh, so in the uh, vein, and gases in the vein and portal vein. I can't hear you clearly, Aaron. Okay. Um, so I said uh, um, it looks like there's a transition point. Uh, well, there were two transition points here um, causing the small bowel obstruction. And I, um, I was looking for uh, evidence of any bowel ischemia. Very good. So, uh, what do you look for bowel ischemia? Um, so, I looked for any hypo or hyper enhancement of the bowel wall, any rheumatosis coli, any gas within the small lesion type veins, or any gas within the uh, SMV or in the portal vein. So, examining the small bowel loops here, it looks like there's normal enhancement. I'm going to scroll back up to the um, uh, liver and within the SMV to make sure there's no gas within the, the venous um, the veins. Yeah, so what is differential enhancement of bowel? So uh, the differential enhancement of uh, bowel uh, can be either hyper enhancement or hypo enhancement. Um, I'm struggling with the uh, with scrolling. Um, it's okay, you can just answer the question. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so, what could you, could you uh, just differential enhancement of the bubble? So, what, what does that mean? Different enhancement. Um, you mean different enhancement of the actual layers of the bowel, so like mucosal enhancement, and then I think we have lost your audio. Can you hear me? Okay. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Hello? Yes. Oh, hi. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, so if you stop on that particular image, stop yeah. now. So you can yeah. see there are two loops of bowel, one on your right yeah. hand and one on your left yeah. hand side. Yeah. So there is a difference in the degree of bowel wall loop enhancement. Yeah. Which of yeah. these bowel loops is a normal one? So is this the normal one or is this the normal one? So this is the normal one here because you can see the enhancement of the mucosa quite clearly in the wall. Whereas on the left hand side here, um, you can't see that enhancement. It's quite so this is the abnormal or non-enhancing yeah. one or ischemic. Yeah. So that's very good. Okay. Yeah. So what will you do next? What would you advise the surgeon? Like, well, where is the cause of? What is the cause of obstruction? Um, so we have a transition point in the lower pelvis. The most common cause of uh, transition point is um, a regional small bowel obstruction. Second most common, uh, or another one could be uh, an internal hernia. But this does have features. Uh, uh, is in the so, in my, uh, the swirl here within the yeah. mains, isn't it? So this is an internal hernia yeah. resulting yeah. in uh, uh, closed loop structure. Yeah. Very good, very good, excellent. I'll get you to do one more case. So that's you're getting all the hard cases. Sorry, <laughs> you're doing well. So this patient presented with uh, epilepsy. Okay, so I want to give you two sequences so that uh, just the standard sagittal T1 and the T2 weighted sequence. So feel free to scroll through. So click on the image and then scroll. So um, on the left, we have a sagittal T1 sequence. Uh, a patient who has, who has epilepsy. <clears throat> so the normal midline structure is you can see the bonds the brain, uh, there's no aspect of that. 
So most of these have now so it's interest within the intervention uh important. There is also intense to low signal um, areas mm -hmm. which are projecting with the interventions in the lap here and here and also here um, in the patient and in a patient, the preventing the seizures, we've got these infant buildings and will be concerned that this is due to sclerosis and we are uh, on our phone. And then we can get to the rest of the study now. I can't hear you, Aaron. I think uh, we need to sort your audio for the next time. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. Right. It's uh, awful, then we can. Uh, I keep losing you. In the... Oh, sorry. I was. I did, I'm not too sure where I, 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 I put out, but um, I'm saying there are some um, intraventricular lesions. Yeah. Particularly within the fourth ventricle. Um, in a patient with epilepsy, it's concerned with his um, tuberous sclerosis. Mm -hmm. And then I was um, just having. Um, so do you think it is intraventricular nodule or is it, uh, does it, what's the signal intensity? Does it look like a normal brain tissue or is it like a proper nodule with calcification? So the patient uh, on the study looks quite old because we've got normal myelination and normal structure structure. So in a patient of that age, you can think that these are calcified and you have signal dropout. Um, but we're not, we've not got that area. The, the lesions themselves are quite, quite so intense and um, there's no signal. Um, looks more like a grey matter, doesn't it? Yeah, so um, the other abnormality that's just been is um, sort of like a rest of the grey matter. Um, it can be like grey matter testicopias. Yes. Um, which, uh, which is another cause uh, of seizures. Uh, Correct. Yeah. So this is a case of gray matter heterotopia. And uh, what would you do uh, in terms of management for this patient? So um, I'd alert the referring team. Uh, this patient needs to be discussed with the child of the new agency. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand what you're saying because <laughs> it's very muffled. It needs to be discussed in the epilepsy MDP. And uh, refer to the um, to the uh, new new as well. Yeah, very good. Okay, <laughs> right. I'll have to stop you here because uh, the interaction is not very good in terms of uh, uh, the voice is very muffled. And then we have gone through four cases. Uh, I think you're doing really well. Uh, uh, I don't have any. Uh, uh, you know, like uh, suggestion to improve your technique. I think your 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 eyes are trained to look and spot the abnormality, so you are picking up the abnormality quite easily. Uh, I would say uh, you are not moving swiftly to the next section of your answer. At times, you are requiring to be prompted to go from observation to interpretation or diagnosis. So you just need to. I'll be a little bit. Um, quick and jumping to the next section. So that would be my only, but otherwise you're doing really well. Okay. Apologies to my, um, uh, now it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> so it was not helping. So again, for the next session or even for the exam, uh, I make sure that you have a good broadband and uh, you got good uh, uh, setup for the yeah. Viva. Okay, yeah. so the mesentric valvulus was really good. So the teaching point on that one uh, was uh, to look for the site of uh, transition. So you were spot on. So you could say that uh, there are multiple loops of dilated bowel loop with differential enhancement and you, you identified the segment. So I was very impressed because uh, especially looking at the feces sign. So that's the so you should always look for small ball feces sign. So that will be just proximal to the site of obstruction. So this will be the game changer. So whenever do you are do looking for any CT scan uh, and looking for a bowel obstruction, look where the feces is. So the transition will be just distal to it because that's where 
the feces will go and sit as a dependent portion. So this is the transition and you can see just proximal to it, there is a feces. So you spotted that and that was the uh, best uh, part of it. And again, you can see there is whirlpooling. So if you scroll up and down, so you can see that's a transition. And differential enhancement is uh, some of the loops not enhancing and some of the loops enhancing normally. And that's why it's called differential enhancement. So you can see a loop on the right, which is looking normal. On the left, it is looking abnormal. And uh, this is uh, important to recognize for the surgeon because you need to tell them which loop of bowel is ischemic so that they can go and resect it. So that was really well done. So you, I would say you scored a 7.5 on that one. And also on the epilepsy, you scored the uh, uh, seven. And with the gastric band, you struggled, but you're not the first ones to uh, <laughs> struggle <laughs> on this one. Because if you're not seen it before, you are definitely going to struggle with this case. But that's the whole point. Uh, so I will show some cases which are classical and some cases which uh, I want interaction with and uh, some cases which you probably have never seen before. So that would how the FRCR to be viva would go. You know, so we would like to know how the candidates perform in different scenarios. And uh, it's not about knowing uh, how much uh, radiological knowledge you have, but it's also how you approach to a situation. So that's very important. They want to see whether you're ready to become a, you know, like, this is more like, uh, like, can you move to the next care, like be a consultant, take decisions and things like that. So that's all it is. So when you get a case which you have no clue, you just do it systematically. So here you can say that I have not seen this before, but it looks like it's in the region of stomach. So probably it's related to some kind of stomach right. tubing. So you did mention like uh, there was a, a peg tube you mentioned, but that looks a bit more uh, straight and uh, more metallic, isn't it? Yeah. So it looks... It's going to be... Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's basically the same thing. You know, if it, uh, it tells yeah. you the same direction, it's, it's, a, it's abnormal work. Yeah. You, you are allowed to say that I've never seen this before in the exam. So that's okay because radiology is so vast that we all wouldn't see all the uh, abnormalities in the world. So there are still cases which I have probably not seen. And I still keep getting amazed with uh, when my colleagues show me some really interesting cases. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's okay. And uh, then when there's at that point, the examiners will prompt giving you tips saying, like I said, this patient was trying to lose surgery, so it must be a type of bariatric surgery. Yeah. This, is, this is a gastric band. Uh, so normally a gastric band should not look like an open O. So this is an open O sign. So it should look like this. Uh, so you, in the X-ray, you should not see the hole. So if you see the hole, that means it has slipped. Okay. And also gastric band is like a rubber band. So if you imagine a rubber band and you put it into an inflated ba uh, balloon, so it, it just constricts a bit of the stomach so that the capacity of the stomach is reduced. So normally, if you imagine if the uh, rubber band is uh, sitting on a balloon, it should only have one loop of balloon going through it. So that's exactly what's happening with the stomach. Whereas on the CT scan, you can see that there are two loops. That means a loop has slipped and therefore it has become a closed loop obstruction. So therefore the patient needs to go to theater. So that was also very well done. And uh, the other case I showed you was uh, osteochondral defect. So that's an important case actually uh, in the exam because uh, uh, examiner wants to know uh, whether this patient needs to go to theater or not. Okay, and you rightly picked up. I was quite impressed when you located it's. It's not a very optimal uh, uh, scan. It's quite noisy and it's a fat suppressed sequence. So bone fragments are really hard to appreciate unless your eyes are trained to look for it. So this is a cortical bone. So it's as black as the bony cortex here, and it is sitting here. And the dimension of the def uh, of the bone fragment is very similar to the defect size itself. So you can see that that's the defect. <laughs> And there is only fluid in it. So you don't see a bone fragment. So in the exam, you're allowed to say that I can see an osteochondral lesion in the medial femoral condyle, but I don't see the bone fragment in the defect. So it must have gone out. If the patient has got a locked knee, I would expect to see the bone fragment. And that's what you're going to do. And you hunted it down and it is seen here. And you tell the surgeon the same thing, that it is located anterior to the lateral malleolus on the lateral side. So it has actually crossed to the other side. So 
do an arthroscopy and retrieve it. Okay, so I think you did really well. So good luck with your exams. Excellent, good. So we've got another 25 minutes before we commit today. So I want to, who is going next to the, we have eight of you, isn't it? So I'll do the fourth one now. And then the re remainder four, we can do it next time. And I would prefer to see your faces when you are doing Y. So for next sitting, please get webcam if possible. So who is going next? Stop remote control. So let me see. We are done, Sami. Samyukta. Tom, do you want to go next? Is Tom on call? I am on the call, yeah. Yes, brilliant. <laughs> right, Tom. So where are you right now? I'm at work. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> Where are you working now? Blackburn. Blackburn, yes, you did mention before leaving, isn't it? So let's go to set three. I'm just going to get through some cases for you. Okay, Tom, this is your first patient. Just a uh, chest X-ray in a routine reporting pile. Okay, so this is a plain chest radiograph of a skeletally mature patient, um, possibly male, don't see any breast shadows. So there is um, a white out of the left hemiphorax with, um, it looks like volume loss uh, with a mediastinal shift to the left and possibly raised hemi left, left hemidiaphragm. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't see any surgical clips uh, that would be one of my differentials for this appearance but in the absence of any previous surgery i'd be concerned about a complete left lung collapse um so when you say left lung collapse so it is it like an acute left lung collapse do you mean like suddenly the patient has got a whole lung collapsed so yes that is for a whiteout, that is the... Yeah, I know the collapse uh, of upper lobe, lower lobe, or lingula kind of a thing. Uh, the whole lung collapsing, is it normal? No, it's quite uncommon, isn't it, for the whole lung to be collapsed? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, unless, of course, if someone has ingested a foreign body or something like that, which sits in the main, you know, left main bronchus. Yes. That's a possibility, Yes. And what's happening? Yes, I agree. There is a complete uh, uh, reduction in lung volume and uh, there is whiteout. So this is not pleural efficient because there is no mass effect. Yes. So what's happening to the right lung? So the right lung um, is hyper expanded. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it does look... I mean, it's hyper expanded. I mean, because yeah. there's some shift to the left, but I guess... So that's, uh, what is that uh, process called as? Um, I'm not sure. What you mean. Like one lung is not working, so the body takes over and uh, increases the size of the other lung. So it's compensation. Correct. Compensatory hyperinflation, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So when you get compensatory hyperinflation, is it a acute process or a chronic process? This uh, compensation is more of a chronic thing. Yeah, good. So now you want to tie things up and tell me what's happening? So I guess um, I'm thinking that there is um, a history of surgery, uh, maybe a left pneumonectomy. No. There's no rib which is resected. There are no surgical clips. The patient has never had surgery. Um, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's okay. So what if, if you get this in your normal reporting pile, what will you do normally? So I'd compare with previous imaging for first. Good. So this x-ray looked exactly the same 
20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Okay. Um, so, so there's nothing to, acute to be done then, I guess. Um, what's causing this? Um, in the absence of previous surgery, I guess there could be um, it could be a previous infection, um, or there could be, I don't know, can pleurodesis cause this appearance? Uh, that's done with chalk, isn't it? So, you know, it looks so homogeneous. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, uh, I'll tell the diagnosis. Patient never had a lung. They never had a lung. Right. Okay. That's right. So, what's that condition called as? As a child, he was born with one lung. I've never heard of that. Agenesis. Pulmonary agenesis? Yes. Wow, okay. Okay, so when you get a, a, homo, a unilateral whiteout lung with loss of lung volume, there can be only two things that can be happening. One is patient has had a surgery, as you mentioned before, like a pneumonectomy, and therefore the lung is not there. Or the second thing is patient never had a lung on that side, okay, which is the case. So pulmonary agenesis, it's a congenital abnormality. So in any other cause of uh, unilateral whiteout, there will be mass effect to the opposite side. It's only these two conditions where there is loss of lung volume and it is seen on the one side, okay? Very okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Next I will thing. read about that. Yeah, <laughs> good stuff. Uh, case number two. Okay, so I want to give remote control to you. Right, how do I do that? I'll give you, don't worry, just okay. accept and then click on the image. Yeah. And then uh, you can scroll through by clicking on the, just uh, leave, let go the mouse. Just give me one second. Okay. Now, do you have a scroll wheel on your? Um, yes. Yeah, just scroll through with your scroll wheel. Instead of dragging, use the scroll button. Okay. Scroll wheel, yeah, on the yeah. mouse. All right, okay, see. So this patient is being investigated for epilepsy. Okay, so this is a sagittal T1 MR. Um, so there's multiple abnormalities in the supratentorial brain. Um, so there's multiple um, slightly hyper intense lesions. Um, so do you think this is a pre or post guard scan? Um, just looking at the nasal septum, this looks like a pre-contrast. Mm. It's not what obvious. The meninges? So look at the dura here. Look okay, at so, so this is a post-contrast scan? Post-contrast scan, yes. Um, so these lesions are mostly homogeneously enhancing. Mm -hmm. Although there's one here anteriorly, um, which shows some signal dropout, so it's probably calcified. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see in some of these lesions, I'd, I'd like to look at this a bit more on other sequences, but I can what I can see is some of these lesions uh, are luxural based with a, a meningeal tail. Um, so this looks like meningeomatosis because there's multiple lesions. Um, so you could get this, I'd, I'd like to correlate with the history. Um, see if there's any um, previous, I mean, I suppose you can get it with radiotherapy, but I think my main differential uh, would be neurofibromatosis um, type 2, where you can get meningiomatosis. Multiple meningiomas. What else is neurofibromatosis type 2 associated with? So you get multiple um, meningiomas and ependymomas and schwannomas. Okay. And uh, anything in particular? Vestibular. Vestibular schwannomas. So do you want to see? Look for it. So yes, so yeah, okay. Um, so that will confirm your diagnosis, isn't it? If you have a so click on the image and scroll. 
Right. So I'll look at the IAMs and I can see that the left IAM is, um, there's enhancements within the left IAM. Um, possibly a little expanded as well. So there's a, a lesion arising from the left IAM putting together with the other features. Of the, this would be in keeping with um, a vestibular schwannoma. Very good, very good. So vestibular schwannoma, multiple meningioma together, they form neurofibromatosis type 2. Okay, what are the features in neurofibromatosis type 1? So you get... Um, so you get um, multiple um, neurofibromas um, peripherally um, and you can uh, get cafe or lay spots um, and leash nodules. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, yeah. Leash nodules, is it tuberous sclerosis? Sorry? No, I got a bit confused. I thought it was tuberous sclerosis. The leash nodules, but no, yeah, you are right. Um, I, just, over the, I suppose you can get some other peripheral manifestations such as um, uh, like cystic lung diseases associated with neurofibromatosis type 1 as well. Excellent. Good. So let's move on to the next case. Good, good stuff, good going. And how do you manage? So what's the management on that case? So um, I would ring the clinicians and tell them... Um, about the findings, of course. I, I mean, I didn't see anything acutely abnormal, but I'd want to look everywhere else. Uh, mm -hmm. But they need to be referred to a neurologist and uh, um, discussed in the neuro-oncology meeting. Yeah, it's uh, neuro-oncology and epilepsy meeting as well, isn't it? And then yeah. genetic screening. So that's the word you need to use. Okay. When you see cases which has got a syndromic association, like uh, tuberous sclerosis, neurofibromatosis, or any autosomal dominant, any other condition, autosomal dominant, polycystic kidney disease. When these cases come in the exam, then you have to tell the, that I would look for genetic, I would do genetics. Okay. Training. Okay, good. So this is the next patient, again, uh, presents with anterior knee pain. So this is a MRI knee, so you can scroll through. Don't worry about ligaments and menisci. Okay, so we've got a sagittal T1, uh, PD fat sat, sagittal as well, um, coronal PD fat sat, axial PD fat sat. Um, so just looking, oh, the bone marrow looks okay. Um, but there's this um, abnormal signal intensity in the um, Hoffer's fat pad. Um, <laughs> It's predominantly um, hypo-intense on T1, yes. um, but there's some high signal on the fat sat, uh, but there's signal dropout centrally as well. Um, Is so, it much bigger than the T1? Sorry? Is it just a signal dropout or is it... Any type of artifact that you are seeing on this? So there's blooming artifact. Correct. Very good. So what does that signify? So that signifies uh, blood products. So what all things can bloom on the gradient echo sequence? So calcium could as well. Yeah, calcium. Not as much as blood. What else? I need at least four of them. Uh, metal. Metal. Excellent. Good. So metal, calcium, blood, and... Yeah. I don't know what else. Uh, contrast? Uh, not contrast. You are very close. Metal. Uh, you said foreign body. Foreign body? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> gas. Gas pockets. Gas. Okay. okay. So, so that's especially in knee. So when people fall and if you get any gas pockets inside, they can also blow. But it's the degree of blooming that is more important. So in terms of uh, the degree of blooming, if you take from scale of 0 to 100, so I would say calcium would bloom around 10 and uh, gas would bloom around 20 and uh, blood will bloom like around 60% and then you have metal, it will bloom 100%. Like it's, it's the most blooming. So these are the four different blooming you can get. Yes. So now what are your differential diagnosis here? Um, so... I guess 
well, it's it's within the synovium, so yeah. synovial based uh, pathologies would be my differential, such as I guess we'd have to consider synovial osteochondromatosis, but it doesn't, it's more of like a discrete lesion rather than multiple different lesions. Yeah, and also the blooming is more than calcium, isn't it? it looks yes, like yes. Blood product. Yes. Um, what type of synovial disease gives hemorrhage? Um, hemochromatosis. Uh, that's an arthritis type of a thing, but this is a synovial tumour which gives hemorrhage. So PVNS. Correct. Brilliant. Okay. So that's why it's called pigmented, isn't it? Because it bleeds. Yes. Good. So what's the treatment for PVNS? Um, or how do you manage? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, I guess they, they need orthopedic referral. Um, do they do sign of vectomies? Yeah. So uh, there are different treatment options. But in the exam, I wouldn't go into the intricacies of MSK radiology. So what you would say in the exam is every viva case, you have to talk about management. That's when the film closes. Okay. So in the exam, you would say that this, these appearances are suspicious of a synovial lesion. It, the differentials include PVNS, synovial osteochondromatosis, or even a synovial sarcoma that can bleed. Okay, so this patient will require referral to a regional soft tissue sarcoma services for further discussion and management. They can do a biopsy and confirm what the lesion is, and then they can decide on management. Usually, PVNS, they give a local methotrexate, can shrink the tumor. It's called chemo, chemo reduction of the PVNS, or you can do a synovectomy, cryo, reaction, uh, cryo reduction, or even surgical resection but they are notorious to come back. So they can recur many a times. Therefore, it is difficult to manage these uh, patients. Good. So next case. Let's show you 3007. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so this is a plain radiograph of the left knee of a skeletal immature patient. So um, what I can see is there is abnormality within the distal femur. There is a ill-defined sclerotic lesion. Mm -hmm. um, with a, so it's ill-defined with a fairly wide zone of transition. Um, and there is, uh, it looks like associated periosteal, well, there is periosteal reaction and possibly um, a soft tissue component as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, uh, I think this is a, a, like a Codman's triangle periosteal reaction, which is highly aggressive. So this indicates this is a highly aggressive lesion. Um so my differentials would be a, my main differential would be a primary bone lesion, but other things to consider would be a metastasis. Um, I guess um, my main differential would be a osteosarcoma. Mm -hmm. um, I would recommend that we get further imaging with an MRI and um, inform the clinicians and get, uh, ask them to refer to a sarcoma MDT. Brilliant. Okay. So bone tumor MDT basically. So this is a, 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 this should be like your left upper lobe or left lower lobe collapse when you get a bone tumor. Okay. So first and foremost, you would say is uh, which bone is affected, which part of the bone is affected, and then is it benign or is it malignant? And then uh, what is it causing? Like any other cancer, start from locally and then move peripherally. So, uh, so that's how. So you did really well on this uh, case. So you said uh, abnorm diffuse abnormality involving the distal left femur affecting the metadiaphysis, right? And then uh, with bone destruction, endosteal destruction on the lateral margin and extension outside, which is resulting in periosteal reaction as well as soft tissue extension. This is likely to represent an aggressive bone tumor, uh, likely osteosarcoma considering the matrix looks like osteoid in nature. And uh, 
you would also you can also mention that because of uh, this uh, high uh, you know bone like density within the joint there is a likely intraarticular extension so in my normal practice i would do a local uh, mr for uh, evaluation of the extent of the lesion and then you can do a bone scan to look for multiplicity of the lesion like oh yeah of course primary or metastasis and then you do a ct thorax because you know, these tumors are very known to have pulmonary metastatic yes. so you would do a ct ch chest and patient will need to be discussed in a tertiary bone tumor center the examiners usually tend to ask you would you be uh, kind enough to do a biopsy in your center you should say no no because it has to be biopsy uh, following discussion with the treating orthopedic onco surgeon because uh, these tumors again just like rcc they can seed along the biopsy tract so it needs to be uh, so the surgeons will plan um, uh, the biopsy tract in such a way that it does not uh, cross more than one plane i mean to say say if you are going from the side you don't want to grow through different muscle groups so you just want to go through one group of muscle rather than two or three group of muscle for biopsy so only after discussion at the mdt the biopsy should be planned for any bone tumors happy yes uh, i'll get you to do one more case Okay, so this is a an ultrasound examination performed in a patient who had a renal transplant. Okay, you can click on the image to activate remote control and scroll through. And the patient's uh, serum creatinine is urea creatinine is increasing. Okay, so this is a uh, an old sound of the kidneys, and um, it's not labelled. I'm not entirely sure which kidney I'm looking at, but mm -hmm. this looks like the psoas muscle. So I'm guessing this is a native kidney. Uh, it's a transplant kidney. So okay, so these are all just the transplanted kidney. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. Is a, okay, so just looking at the kidney itself, um, it seems to be generally well-maintained grey-white uh, cortical medullary differentiation. Mm -hmm. oh, just on this image here, there's some um, echogenic foci, uh, which looks more in the cortex. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. We'll go into the highlight as well. So. Sorry? Does this echogenicity stop here or does it go into the center? It goes into the center. Mm. So, so I guess that's okay then. <laughs> right. I mean, in the exam, you can put it in a very nice way, saying that it's very difficult to interpret ultrasound images performed by someone else, you know? <laughs> nice. <laughs> But yes, uh, in uh, but you just have to talk through the image saying it's, I know it's a very difficult case to discuss because you are not scanned it and you don't have the correct clinical picture. Basically what's happening is uh, a patient has had a transplant and it's not working and it's within the first 48 hours. So what are the complications you would look for in the first 48 hours post-transplant? So um, we look for any perinephric collections. Correct. Um, I don't see any um, perinephric collection. Yes. Um, any like features of obstruction. Mm -hmm. um, th these calyces look a bit prominent, but th they look okay without anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll give you a CT scan. Okay, so that uh, probably will be much better off. Non-contrast CT, feel free to scroll through. 
Okay. Um, can I just zoom a bit? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's better. Okay, so this is a non-contrast CT of the abdomen and pelvis. Um, so I can see this transplanted kidney in the left iliac fossa, um, which looks um, quite swollen. Mm -hmm. um, the native kidneys are atrophic. Um, so, so this it appears quite swollen. It's difficult to comment on the uh, the cortical medullary differentiation on this, obviously. Um, but there's this high It looks like there's high density within the collecting um, system. And there's also I've also noticed um, a couple of locules of gas as well. Um, so is it the collecting system? If it's a normal kidney, you would have a collecting system like that. Uh, so this could just be the vessels. Yeah. So it's a renal vein thrombosis. That's uh, okay. That you'd like to exclude in a, an acute phase. Of course. Yeah. Okay, so that's exactly what you were saying on you. You were spot on when you looked at the ultrasound, saying that this you identified the. So let go of the mouse. Yep. So you did uh, see those uh, bright shadows here. So that is all the thrombotic, you know, hyperechogenic. And uh, you, when you have gas, it looks like a reverberating artifact on ultrasound. So that's what you are seeing on this uh, scan. So it's a bit with uh, renal vein thrombosis in a transplant kidney. So again, uh, I showed you different uh, case mix, like some which are quite obvious, like PVNS, and some which needed a bit more discussion and interaction with the examiner. So in the exam, you won't get everything on mini or everything, you know, like a, a struggling case. It will be uh, an assessment of uh, how you will approach the cases and what, what your deduction analysis power. So I think you're doing really well. So keep practicing, I have uh, no concerns about uh, the way you are getting through. Oh, thank you, Dr. Shamsi. <laughs> will, will everyone be as nice as you when they're examining us? Hopefully. You I want to see the other me. side of me? I can see yeah. the next, next one. <laughs> I think uh, the examiners, uh, uh, I mean, I have uh, been doing FRC 2B teaching for a very long time now, and I've interacted with several examiners, actual examiners, as well as uh, chief examiners in the college. The idea is not to fail anyone or to give any trouble, okay? So everyone is trained to uh, guide the candidate in the right direction. If they are completely, the, some, some candidates can get, you know, like on the day, on the occasion, it can be overwhelming. They'll try to relax the candidates and there'll be, uh, there will be a few examiners who won't talk at all. So they may not guide, but that's just a few percentage of them. But most examiners, are not trying to trick you. They're going to lead you. So if you are going in the wrong direction, they'll try to drag you back into the right direction. So whatever they say, don't treat them like they're judging you or they're trying to mislead you. So they may be trying to uh, 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 bring you into the right path. Okay. Or sometimes they may be challenging when you are super confident in terms of whether you're actually meaning or is it like, you know, they just want to confirm whether it's, uh, you really mean it or uh, is it just that you're going with the flow of it? So I think uh, examiners are quite uh, very friendly and uh, they, they, are not, they are not going to harass you in the exam. Great. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. I hope you enjoyed uh, uh, the teaching session today. So I'll see you in two weeks time. And uh, yeah, thank you for allowing me to stream it to the wider uh, group. So people can look through the, the discussion and help them as well. So, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shamshuddin. That was really good. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much. All right, Bye. thank you. But Dr. Shamshuddin, can I just ask quickly, is it is it like every fortnight at the same time or? Uh, it's, I, I have only arranged two sessions, but we'll see. Oh, okay. If do any more, I'll let you know. So uh, the next one's in two weeks, is it? This time. This time, yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. All right, thank you, boss. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Abhi. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Abhi, too. Thanks. Thanks. I'll close the meeting now. Yeah.